Lately, I've been thinking a lot about clones. What exactly constitutes a clone in a video game is up for debate, but most people would agree that a clone is a character that is uncannily similar to another. A character or idea that goes farther than just simple inspiration and lands smack dab in ripoff territory. The word clone is almost always used in a derogatory way, or at the very least with a dismissive undertone, but it's funny because clones have existed for almost as long as video games have been a thing. If you think about it, in the original Pong, the right pattern is actually a clone of the left paddle. One of the earliest clones in video game history is also easily the most famous, Luigi, the other brother in the titular Mario Brothers. While Luigi's first appearance was actually in the Game & Watch version of Mario Bros, most people are more familiar with the arcade version, released three months later. Luigi plays the exact same as Mario, and they look very similar too. Their sprites are the same, but Luigi uses a different color scheme. While Mario's colors in the game are very similar to his modern day look outside of his blue hat, Luigi's colors are a bit more unique. He has green overalls, a black shirt, and blue shoes. Clones that are exactly the same visually as other characters outside of a different color scheme are usually referred to as palette swaps. Palette swaps are definitely the lowest of the low on the clone character totem pole. Now, you might think that palette swaps were just made out of laziness, but part of it is most likely because the game literally didn't have the space to incorporate a new character. In video games, every model, every sprite, every line of text takes up memory. Back in the day, games had insanely little memory, so one of the cheat codes game developers would use is reusing old sprites for new characters. Palette swaps are still being used to this day, although nowadays they're used primarily for the sake of cheaply adding in different costumes for you to buy as opposed to technical limitations. Costumes bring us to the next stage of the evolution of clone characters, skins. Skins are just different outfits for your character. They're a step above palette swaps as it's not just the colors that are changing, but functionally the characters are still the exact same. In Smash Bros, Bowser Jr. has skins for all of the other Koopaling characters. They look very different, but they still have the exact same moveset. While skins are a bit uninspired, I can still somewhat respect them, as while they play the same as the other characters, at least they allow for more characters to exist in your game. And depending on how your game is made, you might want the characters to play the exact same as the characters they were based on for the sake of consistency. Having to account for different movesets and attributes in a game requires much more time having to be spent on testing and quality assurance. A pretty early example of a skin in a video game is Tails from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Funnily enough, just like Luigi, technically Tails' first appearance was in the handheld version of the game he's most commonly remembered for debuting in. Despite Tails being a completely different character from Sonic, Sonic, they control the exact same in that game. It wasn't until Sonic 3 that Tails got his signature flying ability in the Genesis games. Clones getting their own unique skill sets is pretty common in long-running game franchises. Just look at Ken from Street Fighter. In the original Street Fighter, he was a carbon copy of Ryu, but in Street Fighter 2, yeah, he was still the exact same, but there is one very small difference though. Ken's back throw with kicks is slightly different from Ryu's, as Ken does a little roll before he throws his opponent. It is very minor, but this can get him more distance on his throws, which could potentially be useful for corner setups. We wouldn't see Ken really become his own character until the later versions of Street Fighter 2, when he got stuff like his multi-hit Tatsumaki and his signature multi-hit flaming Shoryuken. This is where we get to the classic idea of a clone character. Ken is probably the quintessential example of what most people think of when they think of a clone. He is very similar to Ryu, but he actually has some minor gameplay differences to make him technically unique. The Street Fighter series is no stranger to clone characters. You got Girl Ryu, Old Ryu, Brazilian Ryu, Loser Ryu, Evil Ryu, Other Evil Ryu, Other Other Evil Ryu, Other 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 Evil Ryu, you get my point. But honestly, calling these guys clones is a bit disrespectful. Most of these guys have changed so much over time that they've become their own characters. They're Ascended clones, or a shorter name for this might be Derivatives. Similar enough that you can definitely tell they're supposed to be based on a specific character, but they've gone through their character development and become something a bit different. Clones are very prevalent in fighting games, most likely because fighting games live and die by their rosters of characters. Clones are a really easy way of inflating your cast without designing completely new characters. Smash decided to fully embrace the concept of clone characters by giving them the name Echo Fighters. Lucina is an Echo Fighter of Marth. 
She functions basically the same as Marth, but instead of having Marth's signature tipper ability where his sword does more damage and knockback at its tip while being weaker everywhere else on it, Lucina has a balanced sword that hits for a good amount of damage and knockback evenly across its length. Smash also has a really good example of a derivative character in Lucas, being a derivative of Ness. They both have very similar special moves with their individual versions having a number of differences. However, what moves Lucas up from being a simple clone to being a derivative is outside of his similar special moves, his moveset is almost completely different. Good examples of derivative characters from non-fighting games are the Pikachu clones from the Pokemon series. In every generation of Pokemon, the series introduced a new Pokemon that was remarkably similar to Pikachu. Usually they're electric type Pokemon with beady eyes and big colored cheeks. However, they each have their own movesets and stats, plus many of the later clones had secondary types, like Amolga who's electric and flying, and Togedomaru who's electric and steel. The Pikachu clones reached their logical conclusion with Mimikyu, a Pokemon that literally cosplays as Pikachu. This one is easily my favorite Pikachu clone. Mimikyu honestly takes things even further beyond just being a derivative. It has a completely different type combination from Pikachu, not even being an electric type anymore. Despite the fact that it's trying to be Pikachu, it very much is its own thing. I'd call this type of character a spin-off. Similar to a spin-off game like the Extreme Beach Volleyball games to the mainline Dead or Alive fighting games, this is where characters start to really become their own people. A really good example of a spin-off comes from Yu-Gi-Oh! The elemental hero monsters are bright colorful warriors based off of American superheroes, whose main gimmick is fusing together with each other in the same way elements can combine together to form new elemental heroes that can deal a ton of damage. About a year after the elemental heroes were released in the card game, the Destiny heroes were introduced. The Destiny heroes are a lot more dour and dark than the elemental heroes, and they seem to have more of a British influence. Instead of focusing on fusion, the Destiny heroes are focused on time. They have a lot of very strong effects, with the downside being you have to wait some time to get the most out of them, which of course fits with the Destiny part of their name. While they are both a part of the hero super archetype and they both work really well together in the same deck, these two different hero sub archetypes have their own distinct identities. Once you go past spinoffs, at that point you're not really even a clone anymore, and you've just become another entity entirely. This is what every clone character dreams of, but in theory, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with being a clone. Clones can be a great way to test out new ideas with an already established template. Ken's Super Combo and Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo would serve as a prototype for some of Ryu's later ultimate moves. The Wario Land series began as something of a collectathon, a more exploration focused 2D Mario game with Wario having more options for combat than Mario. Many of these concepts would become staples of the 3D Mario games. Shadow the Hedgehog took the speed and platforming of 3D Sonic and added and gunplay and vehicles. Clones can also just be a cool way to change the pace and put a spin on a classic, like how Zero in the Mega Man X series is a close range combat version of Mega Man. Bloodstained Curse of the Moon takes the classic Castlevania formula and adds in characters with unique weapons and sub weapons. It can definitely suck when a clone takes up a spot in the roster of your favorite game instead of someone cool and new, I get it, but I do think there is definitely some value in clone characters. So yeah, 